Your return is much appreciated by the CoinSuries channel. Request from viewer is, who is your favorite CEO and who is the best coin for you? You can also comment your opinion. Thank you to all the subscribers of our CoinSuries. Who came to our channel CoinSuries? You will always be info with the latest CoinSuries news. Number 1, CEO Brad Garlinghouse XRP and Ripple. Number 2, CEO Grayscale SEC. Number 3, CEO JP Morgan Bitcoin. Number 4, CEO Brian Armstrong Coinbase. Please like my video and subscribe my channel. Greetings to the breakeven threshold, cryptocurrency in general, Bitcoin, and Ethereum. Wishing you the best. Accurate XRP today, Cardano, with BNB, and a little of channeling, it's a break-even day. Nothing too remarkable, but we're still in the midst of the doldrums. Today, flare is at its best. In Delhi, there was a 28% spike flare was launched when we were trading at around 4 or 5 cents on the dollar. So, I guess you could say I'm not a papa bottle. On the other hand, that was quite an accomplishment since a lot of us were able to buy flare for pennies or senate coins during the great price action. This, I believe, will continue. The main reason for today's increase, in my opinion, was that Google Cloud has joined. Developers can gain access to decentralized data through Flare Network's Oracle system, which is a validator Flare. As far as data is concerned, it is the blockchain. Google Cloud has entered the blockchain arena as a provider of infrastructure and validators, adding to its participation. There is still a long way to go, but the massive announcement gave us a much-needed boost, as this blockchain is enhanced and functionalities are added for usage with decentralized applications, dApps, I expect that there will be obstacles. Although I have high hopes for Flare, we shouldn't get too excited just yet. In my view, as we move forward with blockchain adoption, Flare will ultimately come out on top. If you're not Ripple, you can still sell XRP on the secondary market without committing to a security offering, according to the judge in the infamous SEC vs Ripple case. This makes perfect sense when you think of XRP as a commodity. However, what about demand-side liquidity? Even though Ripple is selling XRP to institutions directly as an investment, she merely included it in all the other securities offers that the company was making. How they can say they provide direct sales when the user only has 4 seconds to retain the asset is the real puzzle, according to Cash to Hear. As far as anyone can tell, it's not for investment purposes. This is the point of contention, then. Based on what we know about on-demand liquidity and how it works, we can break it down into two main categories. You shouldn't have any investors because the perfect buyer isn't buying XRP for its investment potential, but for its payment convenience. The secondary market is XRP's birthplace, as we discovered as well. After that, what do we learn from this? Judge Torres's failure to investigate Ripple's corporate practices would be a huge disappointment. Our information suggests that Ripple obtains liquidity from the open market, but my hunch is that when dealing with Odeal customers, they sell XRP directly to Ripple. Everything would work out well if that were true. On top of that, they may suggest buying extra XRP than is strictly necessary for the payment, just in case they want to hold on to any for future reference. It seems unlikely that visitors would entirely misunderstand the point here. Regarding Audible's operations and relationships with those customers, I have a feeling there's more going on than what's immediately apparent. An investment contract is what it becomes in the event of a direct sale. Furthermore, I presume that prior to moving further, you would take into account the buyer's intention and the duration of the holding period. Yes, I can certainly make that happen. Maybe they have a few somewhere in their files. On the other hand, maybe she said something like, you know what? When you sell to them directly, they avoid the secondary market and its lack of liquidity. It seems she was unwilling to inquire as to the buyer's intentions in this instance. I'm going to assume it's a security product as I don't know any different. Whatever the case may be, our current understanding is just the tip of the iceberg. They intend to put all of their XRP into these pools and suggest that their clients utilize them as a source of liquidity, thus you can see them rebalancing and boosting MLMs. 
Your own liquidity, ripples, or the fact that your mining expenses would be much lowered might be leveraged, of course. I think they'll be able to get a better deal. However, for the time being, that is the extent of my speculation. Maybe there's more to these out-of-the-loop payments, to get that kind of ruling, they're not using the secondary market, but rather getting liquidity directly from Ripple. As this develops, we might anticipate gaining further knowledge about it. A recent article I read mentioned that Tether is becoming more popular among money launderers. More and more individuals are choosing stable coins these days. Of course, lawbreakers are human, too. They think about the resources that are accessible to do the assignment, for instance. What they do for a living is illegal. This isn't necessarily a bad thing about stable currency, either. There is a specific purpose for which criminals and money launderers use US cash, and we are aware of it. Again, it's only a tool, and people are allowed to use it any way they see fit. How did this come to be scheduled at this particular time? Since the limits for each stablecoin will be significantly increased, I believe this to be the case. Wherever you are, in the United States or elsewhere in the globe, you're all over the place. Fresh location among JP Morgan's existing crypto offerings, Bitcoin ETFs are anticipated to garner a significant amount of capital. Because not all of the capital going into these Bitcoin ETFs is coming from new investors, we must exercise caution when interpreting the current volume and events. This was brought up in a comment I made not long ago. A large part of the problem is the high prices and low quality of Bitcoin futures and grayscale products. Because of the lower fees and higher returns offered by exchange-traded funds, ETFs, such as Gray, BlackRock, ARK, and Fidelity, investors are fleeing those funds. In any case, I'm hoping things calm down soon. The historic launch-related fear of missing out, FOMO, and buzz comes to a close. And it will provide us an idea of the volume and demand in that Bitcoin ETF market on a daily basis, along with our real position. Lastly, this is a little strange. The SEC is weighing in on the breach of their former account, which resulted in the fabricated notification of the Bitcoin ETF's acceptance. It was really early, and I don't think it was staged. At the same time that SEC says this. It appears the regulator never lost access to the account, which contradicts the most current regulatory report regarding the attack. So, please explain how this is possible. How did they manage to gain access to the account even after being hacked? We will proceed now. On Friday, the United States Securities and Exchange Commission (SEC) denied that the person or group behind a fake Bitcoin ETF had obtained improper access to any of its devices or computer systems. They plainly don't require physical access to your device in order to take your account. As a result, this viewpoint is very unusual. They obviously didn't descend in a line like Tom Cruise and the agents in Mission, Impossible, did to access their computer. It seemed like a SIM exchange had taken place. Gary Gensler, chairman of the SEC, reportedly issued an explanation in response to the illicit post. Restoring access to their account required an intervention from EC, which took 15 minutes. That makes no sense whatsoever. Determining who is primarily responsible is challenging. You can't trust X's security. My best judgment is that not even the US Secret Service was very vigilant about keeping everyone safe. It is my honest opinion that both parties are likely to be partially to blame in this situation. So, how exactly did this happen? We must ascertain the solutions. There is no haphazard YouTuber behind this account. Considering that this is an official US government account, it's clear how damaging a misleading statement like that may be. It is the shared obligation of both sides to ensure that this does not occur again. The constant blaming of each other is meaningless. However, how can you confirm this without making the problem worse in the future? This is due to the fact that tweets including statements such as we're suing Elon Musk for securities fraud might potentially lead to disastrous outcomes for Tesla stock and associated sectors. They need to figure out what happened and then beef up the protection. On top of that, I can't shake the feeling that someone hacked into the account or switched SIMs. They plainly couldn't compete with the actual device. It is completely ridiculous for the SEC to make such claim. 
leave your opinions in the comments section. It goes without saying that a like or a subscription is always welcome. Until we meet again, farewell.